Guys, so and uh, today I'm going to talk. Uh, is the main problem is to uh, there's a playlist on YouTube uh, where you can see some of those speeches. So the context where I work is Ball.com. We're a large online retailer in the Netherlands and Belgium, and we sell lots of things. Uh, and to give you a bit of an impression, uh, currently our uh, a set of articles that are for sale is around 25, 26 million. One of the things we do with the data we gather from our platform is personalization. So depending on who you are, we may show you uh, the service we just opened in your region. Uh, we may have an overall campaign, some personalized campaigns on stuff you've done before. And of course, things like you looked at, and maybe these are interesting also. And because we want to do that as fast as possible in response to what the customer is doing, uh, you'll see that we do quite a bit of stream processing using both Apache Flink and Apache Beam. Now, the things I'm talking about today are, uh, they apply to both of these systems. And to simplify it, I have chosen a very simple use case that many of you will relate to, and that is making some web statistics. So we have this user who visits our website, and we then produce measurements into Kafka. Now, this is called Measuring 2.0 within our company. And uh, if you look at last year's talk um, at this conference from me, uh, I'll tell you more about the project, uh, about this project. For now, we just assume we have measurements arriving. Now, because we're going to do some basic web statistics, we have a very simple Flink SQL statement that essentially counts the number of page views per hour. And then we want to stream that into HBase so we can put a dashboard with a nice graph on it. This is essentially a very simple web statistics, and that's all we want to do. Now let's dive into what we're trying to build here before we continue. The first thing to note is that time is a really essential part in this. And in this expression, you'll see that we're doing a group by one hour. The question is, what is the one hour? Which time do we want? We have essentially two kinds of time in the Flink uh, processing system. And the most important one we almost always use is event time, because that is the moment the event was originally created. And so in case a dis disruption occurs in the processing, the end result will remain always the same, because the end result is fully based upon the data that goes in. The alternative is to look at either the ingestion time, when did it arrive in the pipeline, or the processing time at the time uh, at which it arrived in the specific processing component. But those change depending on processing uh, disruptions. Also in case of reprocessing older data, you will see a different result. So the end result really depends on the data and the operations of the processing system. Now, the very nice analogy I've, uh, I've seen at other conferences also is uh, the comparison with Star Wars. You know, these are all of the Star Wars episode, uh, movies. And when were they produced? Well, that is the processing time. Uh, first, they created the middle three, uh, then the first three, and then the last three. And then they had two additional movies somewhere dabbled in the middle. And recently, they created the Mandalorian, which is also out of order. So the processing time does not say anything about the time of the actual data. And the thing is that sometimes you need processing time. For example, in operations, where you really want to know, hey, how is the system behaving right now? That is when you have the processing time needs. But in most business use cases I see, you really want event time, because you're going to report on what happened on, in our case, the website. When did a visitor do something? I don't care when it was processed. So we want to do a group by event time in our example. Now, a group by gives in a, in a fixed data set, in a batch operation, is very easy. 
because you have an overview of all events that will all will ever be in the batch. And you can simply group them by whatever attribute you see fit for the use case. But this is a stream, which is essentially a forever changing data set. It's never ending. You will never have an overview of all events. So in streaming systems, there is a different concept. There is something called a window, which is essentially a group by buffer. This buffer fills incrementally with events. And then there is some kind of assessment of completeness. When that arrives, you say, OK, my buffer is now full. I can continue processing with this set of events. So when is this window complete? Now, in our case, we use the time as the indication of completeness. And um, Flink has a very nice feature for that called watermarks. They are essentially hidden records in the data stream. The application doesn't see them, but they exist in the stream. And they are uh, an, an indication of there will be nothing else for this time period. And they are usually created on some kind of heuristic uh, and an estimate guess of, of completeness. Now let's visualize this a bit. So we have windows and watermarks, and we have a very simple application that produces the data, puts them in Kafka, and then our Flink topology is simply a source, the group by, and a window. Now the window here is the interesting part. The window has a sense of completeness by looking at the latest watermark it saw. And it initializes with what I draw here as a dinosaur. Essentially, it's the lowest possible number in the past. And um, that is about uh, 292 million years ago. So dinosaurs only arrived 50 year, million years later. But you know, for the sake of uh, uh, clarity, I still use a dinosaur. So the application produces an event at 11.59, and that grows through the topology. And then the window puts it in a basket for the hour of 11. Another event arrives that goes into a separate basket for the hour of 12. And then somewhere along the line, the assessment is made, oh, we can output a watermark at 12.05. That replaces the dinosaur. And because now we know for certain that no more events will arrive from before 12.05, the 11 hour bucket can be shipped out and put in the graph. The reality is, however, slightly more complex. Kafka, a Kafka topic to be precise, consists of a large number of partitions. And a partition in Kafka can be seen as a pipe small enough that events cannot overtake each other. They're like balls, you know, marbles in a, in a, in a plastic pipe. Uh, they stay within the order you put them in there. And so if we want to extend our drawing a bit to, to capture this effect, uh, it will look like this. So let's redo what we just did. And now you'll see that the 11 o'clock window is not shipped out yet. And the reason is that not all inputs have guaranteed nothing more will arrive. Only when an event arrives that replaces the dinosaur can the 11 o'clock be shipped out. The next step in our process, in our example application, is writing it to a database. Here I've used HBase as the example. And in HBase, uh, you can either have a mutation, which is a create, update, or delete event um, in a single put call where you put that one change in. Now, if you have a lot of changes, that becomes slow. So what they did in HBase, they have something called a buffered mutator, which buffers a couple of megabytes of mutations. And when that is full, it flushes it in one go to the backend. This is faster because it takes a lot less interactions with the backend and thus less waiting for completion. So now I have this application I want to build, and uh, I, I run it on my laptop, and there is no data coming out. And I kind of panic. And the thing is that 
there are problems. And the problems have to do with that the, the streams don't stream as you expect them to. And over the years, I've come to find several kinds of uh, problematic types of streams. And the first type is what I call a slow stream, a very low event rate. The second type is called a slim stream, which is very tight to what we see with Kafka. There are only events within one or a few partitions, but definitely not all. Sometimes you have a stream that is what I call bursty or batchy. Essentially, you are seeing bursts of events going through the pipeline with periods of silence between. But then here it's by design. And there are broken streams. Similar effect, only the, the gaps are there not by design. So let me illustrate uh, uh, these four types with some examples. Um, on, when I'm on a test environment, I usually see a combination of what I call slow and both, both slow and slim. So I have my application, I am there, and I'm producing some events. And those events go into the windows, watermarks are created, etc. Now, as you can see in my other presentation from last year's conference, we do partition by session ID. And we do that because then we can keep the ordering of the events of a single visitor with, uh, uh, by uh, uh, exploiting the behavior of a Kafka partition. And this is very nice, but I'm alone. And because I'm alone, I have to, it, it can take a long time before somebody else puts in an event that creates the watermark I need to get my events out, to get my window out. And if you wonder why it, we just have a 1307 event, why isn't 12 going out? Well, the other input doesn't have an event that guarantees that there will no longer be 12 clock events. So it has to wait. And in this drawing, it looks simple enough. You know, two partitions, hey, uh, put an, open, open a second browser and you're done. Problem is we have hundreds of partitions in our Kafka topics. And the last step of this drawing, I, I also, you know, there's the other problem, the writing to HBase problem. Because the buffered mutator is at the end, just before going to the database, uh, it flushes every two megabytes. And even if I have the two windows in there, because I'm the only one there, this is by far not enough data to flush the buffer. So it's both, the watermarks that are missing and the not enough data that results in no data coming out, nothing in the graph. But we've also seen other kinds of problems with uh, uh, bad streaming. One thing we had in the early days of streaming solutions is that um, somebody was doing an, a, 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 a test to see if our environment can handle the load. So they have this load generator that produces data. And it's important to realize that a window with a bunch of events in there that need to be processed further on occupies some memory. And if the load generator doesn't generate random enough session IDs, it will simply blow it up. The memory footprint of that thing will grow infinitely in because the watermark of the other partitions isn't uh, causing a, a flush, they will stay there. So even though you say, hey, I have a terabyte of memory, uh, it won't work. An example of what I call bursty streams, streams that are by design not very streaming, is the use case we have of external partners uploading data. We are a platform where sellers can upload their data. And the thing is that we have two ways they can do that, either by uploading a file or by calling a REST API or a web interface. So they have this REST API, uh, some processing, and then at the end, something like HBase or Bigtable, where the data lands. 
Uh, we use PopSup or Kafka for the uh, transport and something like Flink or Bean for the processing. Um, and this is the REST API pipeline. Uh, the file upload pipeline is very similar. You upload a file and then for each line in the output record, just throw it in the same topology and it works as this, uh, the same as all the others. Now, if we do it naively, uh, we somebody uploads say, for example, five megabyte file, and then the first two megabytes of those just pass into the database, the second two megabytes just pass into the database, and the last megabyte gets stuck. And then he puts in some events over the REST API, and they remain stuck. And it's all because you are not exceeding the two megabyte limit for it to cause it to flush. The other example that I wanted to show you is broken streams. And sometimes it breaks for uh, destructive reasons, you know, stuff breaks, and sometimes we just go down for maintenance. We have to do something that, that takes us down. And even the largest of streaming systems go down once in a while. I consider the Niagara Falls to be big. They actually went down once. Uh, they had to check the rock face uh, for something. So if that happens in our use case, the last megabyte of data or the last set of records below the two megabytes will remain stuck. So what are the solutions that we've come up with over the years to handle some of these problems? And what are the things that we are working on to see if we can improve it? Well, let's first look at the group by event time scenario. The reality is that our uh, systems are slightly more complex in the real life. Thing is that we are a web shop. The measurements can contain PII data and we have to do some cleansing, some enriching, some filtering, some encrypting, all to conform to the GDPR laws. So one of the things we, some of the things we do in there is detecting visits. If you are idle for more than 30 minutes, we give you a new visit ID, even though you have not closed your browser. Uh, we enrich it with GYP information. We parse the user agent. Um, we do detection, uh, first detection if you're a robot or not. And like I said, we do um, uh, encrypting and cleansing uh, to conform to GDPR. For example, the IP address that is used to determine if you are in Europe or in the US is now cleansed and replaced with 0000. So looking at all of this, how do we do that? What are the primary solution directions we, we have seen so far? Well, the first one is that what if we change the data? Uh, one idea is to inject non-data records that are not intended for the, that, that are not functional data, but are just a timestamp. The nice thing about that is that you can keep using the clean event time processing. The other option you have is changing the processing. Now, one of the features introduced with Flink 111 is that there is an option to have an idle timeout on, on some sources where you can say, hey, if it's, if it's been idle for more than so much time, we assume that there will no longer be additional data coming in and we send out stuff to continue the rest of the processing. It is very important to realize that if you have a event time process based system and you are using these features that you are essentially mixing it with processing time. So now you have a system which usually depends on the event time and in, in moments of disruption suddenly depends on the processing time. I don't like that. I like to keep my systems clean, either processing time or event time, but not mixing them. So what we have done is the inject a timestamp. We effectively have a kind of a dummy front end that always produces events and it's just a timestamp. And every half a second, roughly, we throw one in all Kafka partitions. 
And even though we have a lot of those, because these records are so extremely small, the total overhead is negligible. And in terms of code, it's really simple. It is single threaded, runs, on, uh, runs in Kubernetes, it's one pod. Uh, if it goes down, uh, it is like not that bad because missing those events for like half a minute is like uh, 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 not too much of an issue. So the overall code really looks as simple as this. We have uh, a producer that we connect to our partition or to our, to our topic. Then we retrieve the partition info and then essentially have a while run forever, do some sleep, create a dummy measurement with just a timestamp and throw that into all partitions. And note that because it's each time the same measurement, they have the same session ID and the same Kafka key in all of them. And the impact on the streams, if you visualize it, is that a normal stream now looks like this. And if you have a slow stream with only a little bit of data, it now looks like this. If you have a slim stream with only one visitor, like in the test environment example, it looks like this. And if for some reason your normal production stream goes down or you have a bursty situation, you will see something like this. So looking at the timestamp events or the idle detection, the trade-off, which I mentioned uh, uh, will mix the uh, processing and event time, we have an ev timed event generator that simply cre creates the timestamp events that are thrown into the, the same Kafka the website lives in. And if that one goes down for maintenance, now, because of the timestamped events, the Flink SQL behind it can detect the difference between the site is down versus the stream is down. If you were to use the idle detection, it would not know the difference. And how do we see the difference between site down and stream down? Very simple. If the site is down, the pipeline will still produce timestamp events, but no interaction events. If the stream is down, nothing will arrive. There is, however, one big catch and that we're still uh, uh, working on to solve that in the best possible way. And that is our enrichment step in the middle. We do a key by session ID because we want to maintain ordering per session. And because all the timestamp events have the same session ID, they will end up in one instance of the processing step that follows. So then we have all of those duplicates in one place, and then we have to do something to you know, deduplicate them and forward them. And we must deduplicate and forward them because in general, the number of partitions going in and going out will be different. And our application must be able to handle it because it will create watermarks, use the timestamps in those special events to create those, then drop the special events and what remains should go into normal processing. Now we have this uh, in our test environment um, and this works for us. And I'm looking into currently, can we make this more generic? And what we would like to have is that um, the idea we're currently uh, uh, playing with is what if we just redefine what we call a topology, a Flink topology. So in the current situation, we have two topologies. So the original system uh, at the start of the pipeline, you can say that the wall clock time is the same as the processing time, is the same as the event time. The moment the, the measurement is created, the event is created, uh, those are all the same. So if that then goes into the pipeline, then each Flink topology has to recreate the watermarks with some heuristics. Now, what if we do that differently? What if we say, no, we are treating this as one pipeline, one topology. Then we can say we have a watermark producer, essentially our timestamp creation system, 
that lives at the front of the pipeline, which lives in the same wall clock. And then you can see that the event and the watermarks simply follow each other and you're not recreating them. You are not, there is no need to reintroduce uh, any uh, uh, heuristics. There is, however, a problem, and that is you have to build code that does de multiplexing and deserialization and makes this all work. Um, there's also ordering questions, and um, I'm not going into that because this is still uh, on the drawing board to see if, if I can make this work. Now, the last step in our pipeline that was problematic was writing to the database. And this writing to the database in the example of HBase was caused by the buffered mutator, the two megabyte output buffer. It's good to realize that this was all written in the time of MapReduce, in the time where only batches existed. So looking at all of this code, you'll see that a flush is done on the two megabytes being full and on the completion of the job. Now, if you have problematic streams, there is no end, there is no finish of the, of the job, and the data remains stuck in the buffer. So I ran into this a couple of years ago, and over time, and, and I, I simply fixed it in HBase. So in the HBase uh, producer code, there is now a, uh, an option to set a periodic flush time uh, to flush the buffer. And you can simply say, hey, if, the, if there are records, that have been there for more than X seconds or of, uh, so many milliseconds, uh, then just flush them. And this works very nicely, uh, you know, in a very large stream where you have a lot of data coming in, then uh, it flushes on the two megabytes and nothing extra uh, happens. Uh, if you are in a slow stream scenario, this ensures that every half a second or second, whatever you configure, it will flush it to the, to the database. So if you're developing an application and no data comes out, don't panic. It is very likely that this is caused by normal effects on uh, because you are working on a very slow or slim or uh, 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 development type of stream. And as a final conclusion, I would like to say that buffering is the fundamental thing that goes wrong. And you can make it work even in streaming scenarios. If you are buffering because of your algorithm, like a group by or window, I recommend you solve it from the data. Fill in the data gaps, uh, uh, insert timestamps, and you primarily do that by truly understanding the data and the algorithm you are uh, using. And like I said before, use event time and avoid mixing in processing time because that will make the behavior very complex. If you are buffering for performance, like the buffered mutator in HBase, which is just there for performance, just flush, flush it on a timeout. And this also applies to other kinds of databases or storage systems uh, where you may have this effect. Thank you for listening. Um, and uh, I'm going to check if uh, you guys had any questions.